Imaginative Radio. You are listening to Texas History Lessons, a slow walk through Texas history made in Texas by a Texan for everyone everywhere. Hello, this is Texas History Lessons, and I'm Michael. Thank you for joining me. Uh, With this lesson, we're going to take a look at Texas and the Americas in 1492 before contact. We're going to kind of slow things down for just a second. This will be what I'm going to consider the last episode for part one or season one of Texas History Lessons, where we've been focusing on the indigenous people that lived here before the arrival of the Europeans from across the Atlantic. And we're going to just kind of take a look at Texas as a whole and then look beyond at the rest of the continent to the best of my abilities for a small time frame right here in this episode. Now to begin, I want to recommend that if you're ever in Austin, Texas and you want to experience something great, Travel down to 1800 Congress Avenue and visit the Bullock, Texas State History Museum. The museum is named in honor of Bob Bullock, the state's 38th Lieutenant Governor, who championed the preservation and exhibition of Texas history, and he worked to establish the museum. It opened in 2001, and finally, this year, I had the chance to visit it with my family. The official history museum of the state of Texas tries to interpret the continually unfolding story of Texas. And it does so in an impressive, almost overwhelming scale. Make sure you aren't rushed because you will want to take your time to appreciate each of the many floors of the Texas's history story. It's a, it's a really amazing museum. Much like this podcast has attempted to do, The museum begins with the first peoples that arrived thousands of years ago, presumably across the Bering Land Bridge, in multiple waves. On a massive screen suspended very high at the beginning of the museum is an amazing, awesome map of America. And over several different images of light showing what I interpret as fires of each group of people that spread across the continent, it shows them spreading through the continent And it it begins by stating that people came by land and by sea. And as they spread out, diverse cultures settled in the Americas over thousands of years. It continues by saying empires developed and trade flourished. Near the end, it shows the Americas brilliantly lit up with each community and tribe. And it shares this caption by the 1400s. 50 million to 100 million people inhabited the Americas. It concludes by zooming into Texas and the Southwest. And it says, by the 1400s, at least 350,000 diverse peoples lived in what we now call Texas. 350,000 people living in Texas the confines of what we call the state of Texas. So it succinctly shares the story I've been trying to share over these many lessons. And it feels good to be a little bit validated by the official history museum of Texas. The museum then proceeds to show many amazing artifacts and teach about the various peoples we've been learning about, and then goes on and on to the present day. But this episode isn't going to fast forward to anything with this episode. We're going to stop, catch our breath, and take a look around Texas and the Americas just before an almost 41-year-old Genoese sailor reached the island of Guanahani in the Bahamas and began the changes that erased most of the fires that were shown on the amazing map in the Bullock Museum. The 350,000 people living in Texas were divided into hundreds of different bands. As we've learned from the very beginning, these bands were the result of thousands of years of people moving and living in the diverse regions that make up Texas. 
Also, as we learned early on, Texas was and is a zone of transition, a meeting point of three great regions, the Atlantic Gulf Coast, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountains. And it was also a zone of transition between varied cultures. Each culture developed differently and followed different ways of life based on the resources of the region they called home. The years of 600 to 1300 of the Common Era, or AD as a lot of people will recognize, had been a period of global warming, and the population of North America grew after the Humanos took part in trading corn from Mexico and the rest of the Americas to the south, and introduced that staple that would become the center of indigenous culture and settlement around the continent. Out of convenience, we have compressed these hundreds of bands and refer to them with the names of Coahuiltecan, Caroncoa, Atacapa, Tonkawa, Humano, and Caddo. Down in South Texas in the late 1400s, the fires of many bands we call the Coahuiltecans burned in settlements starting in the north along the sacred rivers of the Guadalupe, the Comal, the San Marcos, and covered the area of South Texas along the rivers of the San Antonio, the Aranzas, Nueces, the Frio, the Atacosa, the Leon, Mission, and the Rio Grande, and even farther south into northern Mexico as far as Rio Panuco. It was a vast area filled with many migratory bands. South Texas alone is over 37,000 square miles. Add in the states of Tamaulipas with almost 40,000 square miles, Nuevo Leon with 25,000 square miles, and the portions of northeastern Coahuila and northern San Luis Potosi and northeastern Zacatecas. These people covered a vast area, and they needed it. We're talking about an area larger than that occupied by all the states in the United States except for a handful of the top ten. There were dozens and dozens, hundreds even, of mostly independent bands that inhabited this area. And they were grouped together because many spoke languages that were branches of the common linguistic stock known as Kowatekon. But a lot didn't. Uh, but the numerous bands, that there were minor cultural differences, but they also had many significant similarities and many of the differences appear to be a result of the different environmental conditions and resources that change as you move from San Antonio in the north all the way down to Rio Panuco in the south. Population levels varied for each band, but they probably had 100 to 300 people per band. Some might have been as many as 500. Housing, weaponry, clothing, survival techniques varied amongst the bands, and the differences between the Payayas in San Antonio and the Coahuatecans in Tamaulipas were probably very different. The Coahuatecans were not a single culture, nation, or ethnic group even, or even a language. David LaVere, in his book on Texas Indians, best explains it. They were a wide scattering of bands with similar hunter-gatherer economy adapted to the arid country of southern Texas and northeastern Mexico. We've grouped them together and branded them with this common name. In Texas, the Coatacons included the following, the Payayas, three or more affiliated bands that lived in an area focused around San Pedro Springs, the site of modern-day San Antonio, southeast of the Payayas, between San Antonio and the Guadalupe Rivers, lived that. Aranamas and the Tamikes. South of the Aranamas lived at least a dozen bands known as the Orahans along the lower Nueces. The Pakal lived in the area northeast in the upstream of the Orahans near the junction of the Frio and the Nueces. West of the Pakal were the Casal Turcodoms near the confluence of the Pecos and the Rio Grande. That's near Comstock, Texas. Down the Rio Grande lived the Catajanos and the Carrizos lived between the Catajanos and the Borados. They did not speak Coateco, and some modern members of their nation do not like being grouped as Coatecon. On the other hand, I have seen others that don't mind it, so we will include them because their lifestyle fit in. It was more a lifestyle grouping than anything to do with actual language. 
the Malakites lived on the Gulf Coast south of Corpus Christi. I was wrong in an earlier episode when I said that the Coatecans only visited the coast occasionally. They actually controlled a large section of the Gulf Coast from Corpus Christi all the way down south to the Rio Grande and then even farther south into Mexico. The Barados lived near Brownsville, about 400 miles from the Casal Turcodoms up the Rio Grande, about 300 miles from the Payayas of the San Antonio area, and about 150 miles from the Malaquites of Corpus Christi, and over 300 miles from the Rio Panuco to the south. I'm just reiterating the sense of scale about how big an area this was and is. And there are even more bands. The Pacawan, Papanak, Irbi, Piame, Zarame, Pahalot, and Tilahe. Farther south, below the Coatecans, in the Valley of Mexico, reigned the Mexica, or as some might say, Mexica. Overall, we call the Aztec Empire. The empire was actually an alliance of three Nahua city states. Mexico, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tla Copan. Again, I always have to give apologies for pronunciation. I'm doing my best. Ruled by the Mexica, or Mexica. They spoke Nahuatl, a variant of Uto Aztecan, the same language family that the Shoshones, Utes, and the Comanches were part of. The Comanches in the 1400s were still far to the northwest in the Great Basin. We'll look into where that is in a little bit. And probably had not broken away from the Shoshone Nation at all. Roger D. Hodge wrote in his wonderful book, Texas Blood. I just wanted to include this because it's a wonderful summation. The current scholarly consensus is that the Utes and the Comanches were both Numic peoples. Numic is a... Variation of Uto Aztecan language family. Numic peoples speaking variations of Uto Aztecan who took different migratory routes out of the Sierra Nevada. One group in the first wave of the Numic expansion traveled south and founded the Aztec Empire. Another was the Shoshones, the parent group of the Comanches, some of whom migrated into the Great Plains by the 16th century. Now, the Aztecs, the Mexica, ruled the area in the and around the Valley of Mexico from the 1420s until Cortez defeated them in 1521. Environment and available resources of where the Coeticans lived forced them to constantly work to provide for themselves and their loved ones. With tattooed faces and bodies, often with lips pierced by cane, and clothed in very little than the deer hide breeze cloth, sandals, and skirts of grass or hide, they followed a semi-sedentary life moving seasonally with small movable huts to the area that offered them the best resources at that time of the year, staying at the lowest a few days in a spot and at most a few weeks. And because of the harshness of the environment, the Coetacons needed a lot of space to gather resources, which they had when you consider the vast territory that the Coetacon bands occupied and that I've tried to illustrate here. They lived a very different life and looked very much different than what most American pop culture imagery that I grew up with depicted when regarding Native Americans. You know the general stock Native American character that pop culture had. Pretty much a plains buffalo hunting tribe like the Comanches, the Sioux. That's what you would be shown in popular culture and in books, or you would be looking at tribes such as the Algonquins and the Iroquois in the Northeast, uh, and the Mohawks, Mohegans, like that. Farther up the Rio Grande from the fires of the Coetacons, in the area called the Trans-Pecos, beyond the Pecos River, in the Big Bend area, burned the fires of many groups that we call the Humanos or Shumanos. The land of the Texas Humanos or Shumanos stretched from El Paso down the Rio Grande Valley as far as the Big Bend region of Texas and into Mexico up the Rio Concho and Chihuahua. They led a very different lifestyle than the Coatecans. But just as the with the name for the Coatecans, there is a flaw in 
that Humanos is a name given by the Spaniards to groups of people that went by different names. As I shared in the Humano episode, many scholars believe the name related to the Spanish word for human, which for once is a fitting name in a way since so many indigenous peoples had names for their nation that meant they were the people or the real people or the real human beings. As one source says, the Spanish apply the term Humano to tremendous numbers of groups scattered over a large and diverse territory, often with very different economies. The Humanos or Shimanos have been ascribed to various places, to pans even in the Panhandle, even to the Wichita peoples living as far north as Oklahoma and Kansas. But in this lesson, as we have been, we're sticking to the geographic location to the people that even today consider themselves to be Shimano. And we'll be focusing, of course, on West Texas, the land along the middle Rio Grande from the Big Bend to present day El Paso that served as their home in Texas during the late prehistoric period to today. Now, one of the fun things about doing a podcast is getting feedback from people. And I don't even mind it when the feedback is a correction because it helps me learn. Like I said, Texas history lessons from the beginning has been me going back, going back over things I've studied throughout my life and trying to catch myself back up. And I'm learning as I go and I'm sharing it with you people. And one of the positive feedbacks I've received was from a Humano person who listened to the episode named Makoa Day, he shared the following information regarding the name Shumano. According to Makoa Day, and I'm quoting the message sent to me, when the Spanish arrived, they did not have a sound in their vocabulary for sh, as in the word the Aztec called themselves, Mexica. So they utilized the X for the sound. Later, of course, we know it evolved to an H sound. The name Humano derives from this change of sound. The early records wrote it as X-U-M-A-N-O pronounced Shu-Ma-No which in their dialect means striped nose people. The X represented in sh sound. The French, who knew nothing of the Spanish name, support this in their spelling Schumann, C-H-O-U-M-A-N. And as old Spanish evolved, the X became an H sound, which is why we now say the new spelling Humano. And that's how the name came to be. That's very informative, and I appreciate that being shared to me. The main town or rancheria for the Texas Sumanos was a cluster of villages at La Junta de los Rios at the confluence of the Rio Grande and the Conchos. They called themselves Otomoacos. In a nearby village lived the Briaches. Together, the two villages are known as Pararabuas. La Junta de los Rios, which is where modern Presidio, Texas now is, is a very important area because it and the surrounding area is the oldest continuously cultivated area in the United States. The oldest continuously cultivated area in the United States. People have lived in that area of Presidio since at least 1500 BC farming. And possibly before that even. By 1500, their descendants, 1580, their descendants, the Shimanos, lived in dense settlements called Pueblos, where they farmed, hunted, and oversaw a large trade network with nations to the west, south, east, and north. They lived in several towns and ranch areas, growing corn and other foods along the Rio Grande and other streams from its confluence with the Conchos northwest to El Paso. Other Humanos were less sedentary. They were the Plains Humanos. They lived in buffalo hunting camps that stretched out into the arid lands west of the Pecos River. They definitely had cultural ties to the great Western Puebloan cultures that we're going to look at in a little bit here. If not by blood relation, then definitely by cultural influence and way of life. 
Uh, another group, the Cagua Tues, lived up the Rio Grande, about midway between La Junta and El Paso. The Tan Pacoas lived at Paso del Norte, or El Paso. And they're also known as Monsos. Now, apparently, like the Coatecans, there is no single Humano culture, but really several related cultures or bands that live similar lifestyles. They were successful farmers, hunters, and traders. And while some sources do say they were friendly and others say docile being friendly, like the Karank was also could be, does not mean that they did not fiercely defend themselves when force was necessary. That was a point that was made to me by some modern day Humanos living down near Presidio, I believe. They were also some of the very first indigenous horsemen north of Mexico after the Spanish invasion. But like I said, we're not getting to that today. To quote again from W.W. Newcomb, all in all, Puebloan culture was as advanced and highly developed as any native civilization north of Mexico. The cultures of the Southeast possibly accepted. Sometime around 81,000, there was a rapid expansion of Puebloan culture, technically called the Hornada branch of the Mogollon. And Mogollon, for our purposes, may be called Puebloan. Southward down the Rio Grande, Humano culture flourished from approximately 1,000 on into the 1700s and then declined rapidly. But again, we're not going to get ahead of ourselves. We're looking at life right before contact. The region where the Hermanos lived served as a trade center and zone of transition for items and goods from west and south to east and north. It was a geographically important area. The Humano villages along the Rio Grande were directly on the route between the Spanish and Mexico and the wealthy, populous Pueblo towns to the north. The Plains Humanos also stood between the Pueblos in the west and the Coatecans, the Caroncoas, Tonquas, Atacapas, the southern migrating Wichitas that were coming down, and the Caddos of East Texas. As one writer put it, they were poised to exploit the spider web of exchange networks that connected virtually all peoples of Texas, and they did so with great success. They served as active traders, being the facilitators of trade, of food, pottery, blankets, salt, between groups as far apart as the Caddos of East Texas and the Pueblos of New Mexico. The river humanos and the buffalo hunting humanos traded with each other. The hunter humanos brought buffalo meat and hides to the river villages and traded for corn, bees, bows, and other ho- a host of other foods and utensils. Both the plains humanos and river humanos also traded with the Pueblo towns along the upper Pecos and Rio Grande, where they could acquire cotton blankets and nuggets of turquoise. They were a nation of traders. Indigenous produced commodities such as corn, salt, buffalo meat, hides, pottery, bows, arrows, feathers, seashells, projectile points, chunks of flint, river pearls, nuggets of turquoise, and other minerals, even Indian captives, all made their way into this cross-Texas Humano trade. On the plains to the north and northeast, and the prairies to the north and northeast of the Humanos, and north-northwest of the Coetacons were the peoples that led a more nomadic existence with a focus on the buffalo as the center of their life. Many of them are the people that would create the Tonkawa nation in the 1700s. The bands that became the Tonkawas, the Tikanwatik, Southern Plains people, were similar to the Lipan Apache that would come later in the 1500s, and they lived a life of the nomadic plains culture that developed there over several centuries. They were buffalo hunters, for the most part, and lived in teepees or brush shelters, and they used dogs to transport their property and hides, and like the Coatecans and Hermanos, they tattooed themselves with black stripes. Tonkawa were made up of various groups, many of which are no longer known by the, their names. These groups are generally considered counted as Tonkawa. The independent bands were the Tonkawa proper, the actual Tonkawa band that gave the name. They actually, at the time of 1500, are believed now to have been actually living north of the Red River. But the many bands that became part of the Tonkawa nation were living in Texas and following a lifestyle 
that they continued to follow. That's why I went ahead and did an episode on the Tonka was, even though they did not come together and form this new nation until about the 1700s, but they still lived here. Others are the Mayaya, or perhaps Magay, the Yoane, which actually was a Wichita tribe that was a Plains tribe um, that were absorbed by the Tonquas, the Irvi Piame, which was a Koatekan band, and a number of sm- more smaller, more obscure groups the Kavas, the Emmet, the Sana, the Toho, and Tohaha, the Awash, the Choyopan, Awal, Ach Ukni, the Quesh, Nil Halai, Ninchopin, Pakani, Pak A Late, Sanuk, Talp, Kweyu, and the Titskanawaticha. All of these groups, all these peoples, and more not recorded carry their fires from campsite to campsite. To the north and west of the bands that would become the Tonkawa were southern migrating Apache bands. Not necessarily in Texas in 1490s or even 1500, perhaps. They might have made appearances on their, that area, but to my understanding, they were still farther north or northwest, moving, being pushed or moving down this way. Now, they're interesting, and we're going to look a lot closer at them in the next season when we focus on the next time period after 1528. Uh, now, the Apache are members of an Athapascan language family. Like the Mexica and the Comanches, they broke away at some time from their parent groups that range from the northwest to Alaska. Athapaskan languages stretch from Alaska to the Northwest Territories of Canada and down into the Pacific Northwest of Oregon, Washington, Northern California. Other peoples that moved to the Southwest about this time that were also members of this Athapaskan language family were groups like the Mescalero and Lipan Apaches that would build their fires in Texas at one point. And then there were the Navajo, who were also related to the Apache, the Hikarila Apache, the Chiricahua Apache, the Western Apache of Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Northwestern Mexico. So they were more to the north. Now going back to the Quay Tacons, if you went up the coast from where they were in South Texas and far to the east of the Humanos lived the nations of the Gulf Coast, the Karankawas and the Atacapas, or the Atacapa Ishak. The Karankawas lived from South Texas to the area of Galveston Island. The distance from Galveston Bay to the border of Louisiana is about 101 miles, and that's where the Ishak, the people known to us as Atacapas, name given to them by their eastern neighbors, the Choctaw, and the Tonkawas lived to the west, and the Caddo's lived to the north of this these people. And directly to the east in Louisiana, they were neighbors to a group called the Chitimaca. And the Karankawas and Atacabas, for the most part, had very similar lifestyles. The Karankawas called the central coast of Texas home, and as one source described it, the area can be a bewildering maze of islands, lagoons, and salt marshes. Topography is low and flat, and thick marsh and river green propane vegetation often obscures the terrain. An intimate knowledge of this area gave the Karankawas safe sanctuary among the many lagoons and islands for a long time against enemies. In addition to an intimate knowledge of their homeland, they also had deep understanding of the variety of resources offered by the bays, river valleys, and coastal prairies. The Karankawan cultural entity that lived there was made up of five principal groups related by language and culture. The Cocos, the most northeastern group, they were reported to have uh, camps along the lower Colorado, and some were also on the lower Brazos. The Karankawa proper occupied Matagorda Bay and Matagorda Peninsula. The Karankawa proper were neither the largest nor the predominant Karankawan group. The mixing of peoples along the lower Brazos suggests that this drainage may have been an ethnic boundary zone between Karankawas and non-Karankawas. The Kuhanes 
were another Karen Cowan band on either side of Matagorda Bay, particularly to the west. There were also the Wapites and the Copanes, or the Copanos, dwelled that dwelled along Copano Bay and on St. Joseph Island and the northern shore of Corpus Christi Bay. And from there south, the Malquites and other Coitacons would have been on the coast. They also wore very little, tattooed themselves along with having facial piercings. And like the Coitacons to the south, they moved within their zone of influence depending on the time of year. When different food supplies and resources were available, the coastal waters supplied the Karankawas with oysters, clams, scallops, and other mollusks, turtles, undoubtedly a wide variety of fish, porpoises, and underwater plants. They also hunted alligators, like their neighbors to the north, the Atacapas, and they used that grease to smear on the discouraged mosquitoes. The main Anna also provided a variety to eat, bear, peccary, smaller mammals, birds, berries, nuts, seeds, and other plant foods. They lived by the seeds, but they were not a maritime people. They based their livelihood on the resources of the shallow bays and lagoons found behind barrier islands that paralleled the mainland. The Atacapas lived along Gulf Coast in the northwestern crescent of the Gulf of Mexico and in the dense forests of southeast Texas and southwest Louisiana. In Texas, they lived along the Sabine, the Neches, the San Jacinto Trinity Rivers, and the eastern part of Galveston Bay. Across the Louisiana border, they lived as far east as present-day Vermilion Bay. They weren't very advanced agriculturally. Perhaps they planted a few gardens with varieties of maize or corn, so they relied mostly on hunting and gathering. They hunted deers, alligators, and all sorts of animals and fed off the wonderful resources like the Karankawas of the rivers and the Gulf Coast. There weren't many in number. Perhaps only 3,500 living in the large area in the late 1600s. But it's impossible to know how many there were due to the ravages of disease that would have hurt them. Now, there were lots of different bands of Atacapas. The Sunrise People, the Eastern Bands, were the Eastern Atacapa. They were the Sunrise Peoples. They lived in present-day Acadania parishes in southwestern Louisiana. They, and they had three major bands, the Alligator Band, the Snake Band, and the Black Leg or Heron Band. The western bands of the sun were the Sunset Peoples. They included the Eagle Band the, that lived along the Calacasu River between the Calacasu Lake in southwest Louisiana, and I'm sure anybody that lives around there probably knows I probably butchered that terribly. They also lived in the Sabine Lake on the Louisiana Texas border. There's the Red Burned Band that lived on the prairies and coastal areas of what is now Cameron Parish in southwestern Louisiana. There was the Panther Band that lived in the areas around the Sabine of southeast Texas. Then there were the river people, the Akokisas, that lived on the Lower Trinity and the San Jacinto Rivers and on Galveston Bay, along with the Karankawas. They probably met survivors of the 1528 Nervaeus expedition that landed near Galveston. Other bands were the Bidets, who lived further up the Trinity, and they ranged from Brazos River to the Natchez River. The Dedosas were a subdivision that had broken away from the days, and um, they, they later became associated with the Tonkawas. The Petiris lived north of the Akakisas in the Piney Woods to the north of San Jacinto River between the Bidet to the north and Akakisa in the south. And these were the peoples that followed the lifestyle, kind of like the Karankawas, much like the Karankawas. But they had their own identity, and they're still around as well. And to the north and west of the Karankawas and Atacabas lived the people we called the Caddos, who were the tribe in Texas or nation in Texas that achieved the highest level of cultural development within the borders of the state. Perhaps you could argue that the Shimanos also had similar success. They reached this higher level of success with advanced techniques and tools that made them highly successful farmers their relatives the Wichita who arrived later in Texas are the only other tribe 
to reach this level of sophistication. The ability to grow an abundant food supply made it possible for the Caddo to achieve a relatively dense population in social complex institutions that more so than hunter-gathering Kowatekans and the Plains culture Apaches or Tonkawas could. As W.W. W. Newcomb, again to quote him, the intricate cultural structure that grew from this ample subsistence base is as fascinating and in many ways as exotic as any known in the Americas. And then, as I said in the last lesson about the Caddo's, in large part they can relate their success to their relationship to the greater Mississippian civilization that had flourished a few hundred years before uh, the arrival of the Spanish. The Mississippian culture emerged over the next few centuries from about 800 A.D., to dominate eastern North America, and they became its westernmost examples, the Caddo's were. They owe much of their successful farming village life and religion to the influence of that civilization. The peoples that began to become the Caddo and Mississippi culture had lived in that area of Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma since at least 200 B.C. Early on, the Caddo and peoples lived in dispersed communities of grass and cane-covered structures. They varied in size from isolated homesteads and farmsteads, small hamlets to larger villages, and then to the larger civic ceremonial centers where they had, they copied the Mississippian method of building large earthen mounds, pyramids essentially, that were used as temples, burial mounds, and ceremonial fire mounds to maintain an eternal flame. The Caddo world became a hub for those bringing goods from as far away as New Mexico, northern Mexico, and the Mississippi Valley. And they traded with the Humanos, who reached farther to the west and to the south. Their many trading partners gave them access to certain types of vegetables, furs, and other luxury items not otherwise available to them in East Texas by bartering their baskets, tools, pottery, decorative art, and weapons. They developed and maintained long-distance east-west, north-south trade networks and held annual trade fairs in their towns. They were also especially well-known as expert bow makers, and their bows were very popular items for trade. Not because of how they made them, but because of the type of wood. The Osage orange or bodark tree is what they used, and it made a superior material for a weapon. By about 1500... The Caddo's were divided into at least 25 bands that they organized into three affiliated kinship-based groupings, often to referred to as the Confederacies. There was the Hasinai, the Caddo Hadacho, and the Nachitoches. The total population that may have numbered about 200,000, and that's probably more than likely, my understanding, all the Caddo's in Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. Maybe I misunderstood that, and it might have just been that the Caddo's were 200,000 in Texas out of the entire 350,000 peoples that lived in, in Texas. And that's very that's highly possible, considering that they had the highest level of agriculture and sophistication like that, that and they had many villages so that's something I need to look into a little bit further. If you know, send me a message. Now, all of these different nations burned their fires in Texas for centuries and centuries and centuries. Descendants of people that had come and moved and adapted. And while they were very different, they also did interact with each other. In this lesson and all the previous lessons, I've tried to keep a little bit of a snapshot of what it is like to live here in Texas before contact with Europeans. The Coetacons of the South stretched far into Mexico. The Hamanos traded into Mexico in the Southwest and across to the Caddo's. The bands that became the Tonkawas followed the way of life of the Plains tribes to the North. The Karankawas and the Atacapas followed a way of life that stretched up and down the coast of the Gulf of Mexico. And the Caddo's were the westernmost extent of a vast Mississippian culture. And then the different types of nations that inhabited Texas met at a zone of transition for many different cultures, like their ancestors had for thousands of years, the nations of Texas adapted to the change and had shaped the landscape around them, some like the Caddo and Hamano, more than others. But what about the rest of the land of North America? I am not going to attempt to give a very detailed look at all of the tribes of North America, but I do want to try to paint in big, broad brushstrokes 
what I hope is a little bit of a sketch of what's going on around the rest of the continent in comparison to the way of life here in Texas. And I know I'm going to make some mistakes here, but I'm going to do the best I can. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways to approach the rest of the continent, and I'm going to try to mix them together. I've already mentioned a couple of linguistic families. The Uto has taken language shared by the Nahuatl speaking rulers of the Aztec Empire and the Utes, the Comanches, the Shoshones, and others in the Great Basin and in California is also one of the largest language families. Looking at a map, you can see the distribution from north to south. I've also mentioned the Athapaskan language family that is primarily from the Pacific Northwest up through the Northwest Territories of Canada and into Canada, represented in the Southwest and Texas by the Apaches and Navajos. Now, there are over 50 linguistic families in North America alone, but less than 10 dominate very large areas that make up the majority of the continent. The Algonquin language family is in the northeast United States, west of the Great Lakes and north into the vast swath of much of central and eastern Canada. The Uto Aztecan family covered a large part of the American West and down through western Mexico, reaching down to even small pockets of Central America. The Athabascan family, again, is dominant in Alaska and the Northwest Territories of Canada. There are also the southern islands of Athabascan speakers in the Pacific Northwest and Southwest of the Apaches and Navajos. The Muscogan family is in the North American Southeast, and it was the dominant language family in that area. And I'm going to probably get this wrong. The Siouan family covers a large area from the northern Great Plains down into Central North America, reaching eastern Kansas and northeastern Oklahoma and even into Arkansas and Missouri. And there, oddly enough, were some Siouan speakers much farther east to the states on the Atlantic coast. The Iroquoian language family is found in, also in the northeast, predominantly around Lake Ontario and Lake Erie to the northeast. Then there's the Silesian language family that covers a fairly large area of southwest Canada and the extreme northwest of the United States. Then, of course, uh, there's the languages of the far north, the Eskimo, Inuit. But how do these language groups relate to the original nations of Texas? Well, the Coatecans are part of the Coateco language family that is facility that's just right there in Mexico and Texas. It's not a major family group. The Atacopans also have their own language group, a small isolated language group. The Caddos are, you guess it, in the Caddoan language family. And they actually had more people speaking their language or in that family because if you remember the Caddos, the Wichita's Pawnee, Kitse, and Arakawa, Kara were Caddoan family group members, but they spoke different versions of it and didn't necessarily speak the same language, if that makes sense. Wichita and Pawnee might not be able to have a conversation. They might understand some things, might not. Again, this is something that's a little bit out. This isn't all new to me, and I'm trying to understand it myself. Um, the Karankawas had their own language. The Tonkawa had their own language. The Shimanos are difficult to group. We don't really know. Some might have been in the Uto Aztecan language family. Some said the Tano and Kiowa. Others say that they might have been Athabascan. We don't have a definite answer. Perhaps some of the Mono listeners or experts on the subject could let me know and I could share it in the future. But you see the trend, aside from possibly the Shimanos, all the indigenous nations of this transitional area we know as Texas were fairly localized in their languages without widespread connections to other nations across America in linguistic terms. In fact, many of them are considered to be language isolates, meaning they can't be tracked further than what we know. But what does this mean? Lawrence Thompson and M. Dale Kincaid in a chapter of the Handbook of North American Indians say, language families are groups of languages that can be shown to be genetically related using techniques developed by comparative linguistics. And by understanding these relationships, we can get a look into the relationships between different nations that spoke languages that are similar and get a clue into their history, as Ruth Underhill explains in Workaday Life of the Pueblos. 
that the Texas nations have no wide connections possibly means something, but it's beyond my understanding right now to explain it. So if you have an idea about the further understanding, write me and let me know. And I'll share it. Uh, but since we cannot trace the linguistic history or connections of the Texas peoples to other, it's left to us to explore the continent geographically by cultural areas. And as we've understood from the beginning, Texas is a transitional zone for three areas. The Southeast culture, the Great Plains culture, and the Southwestern culture. The Southeast cultural area includes the Caddo and Atacapa at the most western edge. To the east of them live the Adai, the Vovel, and the Chitimacha that inhabited much of southern Louisiana. East of the Chitimacha on the Gulf Coast live the Biloxi, the Mobile, continuing east along the coast of Appalachia. And when you reach Florida, there's the Seminole, the Kale, Tamukua, Ais, the Calusa. Then when you move north from Florida, there was the Guale, the Watari, the Catawba, Okanichi, and the Zaponi, and, and Tutilo of the Virginia Piedmont. The interior nations were the Tunica, the Natchez, the Tansa, the Alabama, the Kosati, the Uchi, the Hichito, the Yamasi, and the better known tribes that you've all heard of, the Chickasaw, Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, they were dominant nations of the Southeast. And along with the Seminole, they are grouped together as the five civilized tribes. Most of the Southeastern tribes spoke Muskegon languages. The Caddo and Atacaba didn't, of course. The Cherokee actually spoke an Iroquoian language. And these nations practiced an economy focused on agriculture. They had very well-developed societies, which, as we've seen in the case of Caddo, led to settled ways of life. They had these structured hierarchies of religion and society. People mostly lived in hamlets on waterways, kind of like the Caddo's did, growing corns, being squashed tobacco, and other crops. And like the Texas tribes, like the Caddo, the Atacapa, and the Karankawa, they supplemented by gathering wild plants of shellfish and harvesting deer and fish. The southeast was a very well-developed, very advanced area of little nation states. Now, the plains cover an enormous area from the Rocky Mountains to the Mississippi River and from the edge of the subarctic to the Rio Grande. If the Shoshone branch that became the Comanches were on the plains in 1500, they were probably pretty far north. The Apache would have been farther, closer below them, moving on down towards Texas about this time. There were the Wichita, the Osage, the Kawpaw. They would have been living in Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas. Farther north, you would have there would have been the Arapaho, Kansas, Missouri, then the Pawnee, Omaha, Iowa. Farther north were the Cheyenne, the Ponca, Yankton, Arikara, the Santee, the Mandan, the Teton, and Hidatsa. Still going north were the Cinnabon, the Ojibwa, the Cree, Blackfoot, Sarsi. I'm just naming the ones that I think were in this area this time. And that's all moving from Texas north. Before contact came, some Plains tribe, they lived in earthen villages. And they did grow crops. The arrival of the horse changed everything for every group in the Americas. We'll see this later on. But uh, yeah, the idea of everybody constantly being on the move, nomadic way of life, it, some Plains tribes did, like the ones that lived in the southern plains of Texas. They they pretty much were more nomadic all the way, all the time, with their dogs pulling their supplies in homes on Travois. Um, but a lot did. They grew crops to supplement their buffalo focused economy. Um, the the people that lived in the villages for the most part were the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Omaha, Pawnee. Arikawa, Kansas, and the Wichita. They were more reliant on agriculture than some other bands. The Southwest culture group covered most of Arizona and New Mexico and reached into Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. It was the home of the Pueblo, the Zuni, the Hopi, the Humans, the Pima, Tohono, Udom. And they were very advanced civilization in a different way, also relying on agriculture. They grew corns, beans, squash, and they grew cotton, which was an important trade commodity. And they 
built those remarkable apartment-like houses. They were very influential on the Humano way of lifestyle. And they were expert potters and artists, and they constructed stone channels and check dams to control the flow of water. I could go, we could go on and on about each one of these sections. They were influential on the Shimanos of Texas and on other peoples around them. Northwest of the Pueblo and other people of the Southwest lived the people of the Great Basin. The Great Basin includes the intermontane desert of Nevada and stretches into California, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona, touching bits of all those states. It gets the name Great Basin because of the surrounding mountains that make a bowl-like landscape inhibited that inhibits the flow of water from the area. The hunter-gatherers of the basin included the Shoshone, the Ute, Bannock, and Paiute. From what I've read, their way of life at this time seems very similar to that of the Coatecons. More of a subsistence hunter-gatherer lifestyle, not like the Plains tribes that were planting and definitely not like the significantly more advanced way of life and sustenance that the Shimanos, the Caddos, and the southeastern tribes had. To the west, of course, is the great state of California, and it has its own cultural group. It's very interesting. I'm going to look forward to looking into this a little bit more, and significantly more in the future, just for my own sake, because it's, it sounds really amazing. Uh, to the west is California, the cultural area, and that includes northern Baja, Mexico. The area had a diversity of micro-environments, including coasts, tidewaters, coastal redwood forests, grasslands, wetlands, high deserts, and mountains. Sounds very similar to diversity in Texas. And California has an extremely diverse number of people that represented at least 20 language groups. Not languages, language groups. Some of the most prominent peoples living there were the Hoopa, the Yurok, the Pomo, the Yuki, the Winton, Maidu, and the Yana. They mostly lived in many independent groups, from a few hundred to a few thousand, extremely independent, living in their area, and adapting to that environment that they lived in. Those living along the Colorado River did uh, practice agriculture, apparently, but from what I've read, most of the others followed fishing, hunting, and gathering way of life, kind of like the Coatecums, the Atacapas, and the Caracuas and the people of the Great Basin. Adapting to where you live and doing the best you can. And then you have the Northwest Coast cultural area, and that includes the coastal areas of Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, and even into Southern Alaska, and some um, of Northern California. This area receives lots of rain. In fact, I was actually in Alaska once, and I was learned when I visited and I experienced it, it's a rainforest. Much of it is. Um, this coastal area is, at least. And the people there thrived and thrived on the rich resource base that the fish and sea mammals and shellfish and birds. And they had, they also had an abundance of plants that provided food. And, you know, usually it's the people that follow agriculture and pursue it as a way of life that are able to d- develop these complex social st- structures, but the Tlingit, the Haidai, the Chinook, and the Nootka, and others, they proved to be the exception. They had villages on the coast and on waterways with rights to upland areas, and they thrived and developed very complex social structures, and they lived in large houses made of timbers or planks, and they were talented artists, carving both wood and stone. They built large seaworthy boats, and of course, you're all familiar with the totem pole memory poles that were built or created for a significant purpose and are quite striking inland from the northwest coast and north of the great basin was the plateau cultural area that's surrounded by mountains and with two great rivers the columbia and the fraser this land is composed of rolling hills High flatlands, gorges, grasslands, high deserts, and mountains. And it's in the area of Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. It was home 
as I mentioned before, the Salish, the Salishian language group, this is where they were in at, and they went stretched up into much of uh, southwestern Canada. There was the Nez Perce, or Nez Perce. Um, a lot of y'all are familiar with them from the story of Chief Joseph and the horrible events that went down for them in the 1800s. Not in Texas, but we'll probably get to that sometime. The Yakama, the Modoc, the Walla Walla, and many other nations. It was a very rich area in resources, and most of the groups were able to survive by living in permanent riverside villages. And then they would travel out in good weather to forage. But for the most part, they, from my understanding, they, they stayed in permanent dwellings. But this way of life, just like it did with pretty much every group we've talked about, once that horse gets here, it's going to change the way of life for a lot of different people significantly. And now this brings us back to the Northeast. We've kind of gone in a circle here. Across the continent, the Northeast cultural area stretched from Quebec and Ontario down to the Ohio River Valley and even down to coastal North Carolina. And from the Atlantic, it stretches west past the Great Lakes. This was the home to the Ibjibwa, Menominee, the Ottawa, the Algonquin, the Iroquois, the Malkit, Abenaki, and stretching from the northern part of the area at the Great Lakes into the coast. Down the coast lived a number of nations, the Massachusetts, Nauset, Wapanoag, Narragansett, Mohegan, the Lenape, or known more commonly as the Delaware, the Powhatan, Tuscarora, and then lived the Mohican, the, the, the Mohawk, the Cayuga, the Huron, the Erie, the Shawnee, the Miami, the Sauk, Fox, Illinois. Agriculture was very important here as well. And they also had the benefit of wild rice, shellfish, salmon for, to provide further sustenance. This area in the Northeast was home to some of the most complex political organizations, uh, such as the Iroquois Confederacy. Democratic structures were constructed here before anyone from Europe ever set foot in North America. Very advanced groups of people here. Now, some estimates of the population, as said before, of the Americas before Columbus put it, it at anywhere from 107 million to 112 million, with roughly 12 million living north of the Rio Grande, 35 million between the Rio Grande and the Isthmus of Panama, for a total North American population of 47 million. South America had up to 60 million pre Columbian inhabitants, making a total of a possibly 107 million as from one of my Texas uh, college textbooks I get that information uh, for perspective on this though and think about all those fires burning for perspective you got 107 million people living in communities lots of fires burning for each family for each village the caddos each having a sacred flame all across that sacred idea, this eternal flame that they kept burning. The Aztecs did the same thing. The Aztecs had an eternal flame that they would put out every 52 years and then light it again and then light every fire in the city with. That's the way it was in the Caddo villages. If your fire went out, you had to go get the flame from the sacred flame on the temple. But I digress. All these fires burning, bright that picture I'm imagining of the Bullock Museum, all these bright centers of light throughout the east, more sparsely in the southwest and west, and then bright up and down the California coast. Bright, I haven't even touched on the people that lived in the Arctic area and subarctic up north, the Eskimo, the Inuit, those peoples that thrived on their way of life of hunting and then gathering during the, during the summer months. It was amazing survival skills and adaptation that had to, that had created the America before arrival of Europeans. But as I was saying, for perspective on the impact that the contact with Europe had, consider that the native population had declined to less than 6 million 
1650. Another thing, one of the many persistent American myths is that the continent was an untouched wilderness, very lightly populated, an empty, virtually uninhabited empire with resources just there right for the taking. The people that lived here, all they did was travel around and hunt and move around and never stay put. That's kind of the myth that's been passed down through time, but we, we know that's not true. As Alvin M. Josephi Jr. wrote in one of my favorite quotes that I've used two or three times previously in different episodes, almost every community in Canada, the United States, and Mexico was once an Indian community. And those communities before the arrival of the whites were part of hundreds of unique Indian nations that blanketed the entire continent. Now, I shared a picture of a picture that I took from the Bullock Museum on Twitter a while back and a person from a company called Panther City Air. They're, they're a drone video company from my best understanding. They really, really it, actually go look at panthercityair.com, their website, and you can see the quality of videos they do. They're based in Fort Worth. This person saw what I took and the he or she went and got a satellite image showing all the lights you've seen this where the bright lights are shining in all the major cities at night and they took this panther city air took my picture and did a little clip where my picture morphs into the satellite picture of reality now and it's uncanny how close the fires turn into the electric lights of today I was overwhelmed. I'm actually, if you follow me on Twitter, go look at it. You'll find it. I'll try to post it. He, they were, Panther City Air was kind enough to let me have it, the clip, and I'm going to try to put it on my website at uh, TexasSeriesLessons.com. But it's uncanny how this idea that America was empty. It wasn't empty. It was farmed. For the most part, most people from Texas East, they were farmers. They were farmers up in the Northwest. A lot of people were hunter and gatherer lifestyles, but that usually was because the area that they lived in forced them into that, and it was less hospitable to to farming and agriculture. The two things made huge impact on indigenous life before the arrival. Well, one thing, one thing happened before the arrival, and one thing happened after the arrival of the Europeans. The development of agriculture and spread of corn as a, a subsistence resource was a significant change and it allowed people to settle and develop into really wonderful complex societies then after the contact the horse again changed everything and we're going to definitely see that in a little bit but, but I've digressed a little bit too much. And thanks to uh, Panther City Air, I don't think they they listen, but I really appreciate them sharing that with me. Now, I've touched briefly also on the, and in completely on the variety and number of the more than 500 nations across North America. There were over 500 groups of people that had identities and cultures and ways of life across North America. There were also... From what I understand, there were over 50 language families, like I said, and hundreds and hundreds of languages that were spoken. There were kings, prophets, artisans, architects, sculptors, there were poets and doctors. There were land and water trade networks all across the continent. And that includes Texas in this vast scheme into Mexico, because we can't forget Canada and Mexico because there was no border they lived together and traded north and south, east and west. Children growing up then, like now, they could dream to accomplish great things. They could be great in medicine. They could play sports, military service. They could be great dancers. They could be religious leaders. They could be diplomats. And they could be artists and much more. From Maine to the Carolinas, the coastline was filled with farms that had cleared land. They had densely populated villages with fortified walls for protection. Going farther into the southeast, they were priestly kingdoms of mound builders like the Caddos, 
that had agriculture as a way of life. South of Texas, the Mexica ruled the Aztec Empire from Tenochtitlan, a city cleaner and larger than London and Paris. Trade networks like those of Texas spanned the continent. The nations of the Americas developed a varied and diverse agriculture, unlike anything else in the in the rest of the world. It was a vibrant land. Some were more successful and affluent than others, but that's the same as it is today. We have more advanced technology, but there's also people that have less access to resources than others. And in Texas, to get back to Texas, in Texas lived the Coatecans, the Karankawa, the Atacapas, Ishak, the Shimanos, the Tonkawas, and the Caddos, and many, many more whose names have been lost. In a way, Texas was a microcosm of the continent. Hunters, gatherers, traders, farmers, fishermen, craftsmen, artists, diplomats, warriors, priests, healers, and survivors, they all lived here. In 1492, their life did not change. And it wouldn't significantly change for 36 years like it was already after after that, that sailor from Genoa representing Spain landed in the Bahamas and those people's lives changed extremely drastically in the next 36 years. It didn't even change that much in 1528 when the survivors of their Novellas expedition crashed onto the Texas coast and a handful survived, including Cabeza de Vaca. He'll be one of the first people we look at really closely in the, in uh, the next season. Their fires burned on, but change was coming. And one of the things I've loved the most about these lessons on the indigenous populations of Texas before contact is learning that the fires of these supposedly extinct peoples, they're still burning in the descendants that are standing up and saying, no, we're not gone. We're still here. And we're ready to be recognized and stand up and acknowledge our culture and our and our people. Now, that's me trying to do my best to summarize as quickly as possible the way things were the best of my understanding right at the time of contact and so this episode wraps up what is season one or part one of texas history lessons focusing on texas before the arrival of the europeans i personally i learned a lot uh and i intend to keep learning more about this time period i've tried to do my best to pay more attention to the indigenous peoples of texas and even at that I know I've fallen shorter than what I wanted to and eventually we'll return and take some new looks at Texas before but it's it's time to move on to the next phase of Texas history lessons but one thing I will promise the indigenous peoples of Texas aren't going to be shoved aside and just be footnotes in the story going on as you probably if you've gone through all the lessons already beforehand you you'll see that they played a significant role in, in the early history of, of, of Texas. Um, they're not going to be shoved aside and forgotten. Texas was theirs before 1492, and it remained theirs for quite a while after people from across the sea arrived and claimed it, and saying it was mine. You're here because I allow you to remain here. Um, but as I posited in an early episode, I think it was um, the, the, the second episode on Texas, the land, it's one thing to claim a land. It's quite another thing to inhabit and control it. And their fires burned on. But before we dive into the Spanish arrival and conquest, we're about to take a little break for the next few episodes while I take time to prepare. I want to put out a few bonus episodes that I'm excited about. They're going to be fun to do. But I'm doing that because they're going to be a little bit shorter, a little bit easier to do. And I want to focus on doing more research and getting the structure for season two on Spanish Texas ready. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, thanks to the people that support me on Patreon, Jay, Ron, Kay, and a new supporter, Tim. Thanks to everybody that's had positive feedback and comments. I've, it's been a really rewarding time here working on this podcast I want to thank my wife for putting up with me 
while I work on this. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to do this. Um, So there we go. Thanks again for listening. And I'm looking forward to starting the the next phase of uh, Texas History Lessons. Adios. Thanks for listening to Texas History Lessons. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to email the show at texashistorylessons at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook. Visit texashistorylessons.com.